what's foreign interference, what are the methods, what's happening now. Essentially, when a country attempts, country, external agencies, people, try to shape the behavior, the actions, the policies of a target country. Right? And this sort of foreign interference is age old. It's a basic principle of international relations. Active interference so in another country's affairs is a given in international relations. Collaborators within a country working with foreign interests is also a given, uh, knowingly as well as unknowingly. And if you look at methods of such interference, it takes a variety of forms, has taken a variety of forms. It's to start with, at the highest, you get diplomatic channels, often legitimate because you use diplomacy to put across viewpoints, diplomatic activity to persuade uh, another country. All states engage in, we do it, everybody does it, entirely legitimate. But of course, these channels can also be used to subvert and interfere with other states. So we have received, we have been the subject of such favors from China, from Russia, from the US and the UK. China and Russia during the struggles with the communists, 1950s to 1970s, the communists in here, in Malaya, in Singapore, they received support from China and USSR, material, propaganda, overt, covert support. And that kind of interference is not restricted to the period of the communist insurgency. The US, again, if I can just give one well-publicized example, in the late 80s, the first secretary of the US embassy in Singapore, a gentleman by the name of Hank Hendrickson, he cultivated and encouraged a group of lawyers and he told them to go into opposition politics. One of them was also offered refuge in the US should things not go well. Things didn't go well. And that gentleman did eventually get refuge in the US, political asylum, and finally citizenship. Second, of course, using agents of influence, covert, under the control of intelligence agencies. You have recent uh, reporting from Australia, uh, New Zealand, and from Australia, an attempt to control a senator, fund him, uh, control him. Ourselves, just two years ago, we expelled uh, Huang Cheng, an agent of influence. He was a professor at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. He was in contact with foreign intelligence organizations, agents, was controlled by them. Uh, third is the media. A key note, let's be frank, through which foreign states exert influence over domestic public opinion. In some cases through secret funding and control of the publications. In other cases, having agents use the cover of journalists themselves. In the 1970s Singapore, we had two such operations involving our newspapers, the Eastern Sun and the Singapore Herald. Eastern Sun worked with a news agency of Communist China and received funding from them. Singapore Herald took money from nearby sources, Malaysian politician, pushed an anti-government line, was stridently against national service, which was a key pillar of defending Singapore. And the Singapore Herald continuously ran articles against national service and taking money from Malaysian politician. Another conduit, another way of doing this, NGOs, Again, many, many examples. Uh, Ford Foundation has been cited by academics as having been a conduit for money to be given by, to anti, given to anti-communist causes. And another example, in our states are known to target cause-based movements in other states. You mobilize activists to advance the foreign country's interests. So this brief survey will show that uh, Neither the desire to intervene, to shape and uh, manipulate a target country, nor the methods are limited. It's age old, it's part and parcel of how countries exercise their power. It's not new, but the whole concept has been, in a sense, turbocharged, revolutionized 
because the internet has opened up limitless possibilities to advance these interests. And as can be expected, there is now a military doctrine that has been developed for the internet age. It's called the Gerasimov Doctrine, named after the Russian military chief of staff. And he has said the rules of war have been redefined. This Gerasimov Doctrine says rules of war have been redefined. The non-kinetic military measures, such as hostile information campaigns, what they can do is identify the what they call the protest potential of any population in the target country and create that protest, deepen the divisions, increase the hostility among different groups, get the people to uh, distrust institutions, have low faith, lower the trust. When trust in systems and institutions gets damaged, then people lose faith in democracy as a whole. So the Gerasimov doctrine states that these non-kinetic measures done through the internet can, in many cases, exceed the power of force and weapons. And you don't need conventional warfare. You exploit the protest potential, keep the population and the country in a constant state of uh, uh, turmoil and uh, ineffect ineffectiveness and degrade their ability to deal with uh, their own economic issues or external threats. That's how you bring down a country. The combination of these online hostile information campaigns, or HICs, as I call them, and the offline activities, foreign control media, sites, agents of influence, NGOs, groups of citizens who fan the flames knowingly or unknowingly, and all of this combines it's extremely toxic, extremely powerful. And we also see some nascent attempts to combine the different approaches. I'll give one example. A group of activists met with Dr. Mahathir, the Malaysian Prime Minister, last year. They urged him to bring democracy to Singapore, amongst other countries. One of them, PJ Tham, said Singapore should become part of Malaysia, celebrate independence on the 16th of September, Malaysia Day, Tham and his partner, Kirsten, who also met Dr. Mahathir, they set up an organization called New Narrative, funded by a foreign foundation, significant funding, received other foreign contributions as well. And Ms. Khan on video has said that Singapore has failed compared with Hong Kong because 500,000 people don't go on the streets to march, unlike Hong Kong. And she wants to change that through classes run by new narrative. My primary point is, is it right for foreign funding to be received in order to advance these viewpoints? That's the question for Singaporeans. And they combine with TOC, an online news site, targeting Singaporeans. TOC uses foreigners, employs them, including Malaysians, to write almost exclusively negative articles on Singaporean social and political matters including inflammatory articles that seek to fracture social cohesion. They support for a call for Singaporean civil servants to follow the example of Hong Kong civil servants in protesting, making allegations about the Prime Minister, which has led to a civil suit by the Prime Minister, because the PM says they are false and, attacked and are attacks against his character and fitness to hold office. The latter two articles were by a Malaysian Based, you know, we, I say that based on publicly available information. She is supposed, she is said to reside in Shah Alam in near KL, lady by the name of Rubashini. I'm not commenting on the legal merits of the article since it's a subject of a lawsuit. Only that a foreigner staying in Malaysia writes these things for a Singapore site to target a Singapore audience, telling Singapore civil servants to protest, calling into question the Prime Minister's integrity, and has written many other articles to try and influence viewpoints in Singapore. Who controls her? Who pays her? What's her purpose? These are all legitimate questions. But appearing on the internet, on TOC, most readers will just assume that this was by a genuine Singaporean contributor. There are many other Malaysian writers as well on TOC. And it is said that for TOC out of the 14 admins, only five are located within Singapore. Nine outside, four in Malaysia, two in Indonesia and we don't know who they are. Are they Singaporeans? Are they foreigners? 
But online news sites, as we can see from what's happened in Europe, in the US, in many other countries, including Asia, with anonymous writers, no one knows who they are, motivations unknown, who is paying them is unknown. Uh, for all you know, they can be foreigners, as we see in the case of TOC, writing inflammatory stuff, and I've got no interest in social or political stability within the country. Their only interest is to get eyeballs, and perhaps if they are under the influence of other agencies, then there are other interests as well. They can easily be used as tools for foreign interests. Such sites have been used by foreign countries to attack and deepen divisions. This is just a small snapshot example how viewpoints can be manipulated by foreigners. Conflicts, riots, arguments, all have been organized elsewhere and can be done here. So what should the response from countries be? Some, in particular, of course, the tech companies suggest self-regulation. The question is, can tech companies be left to self-regulate in the absence of legislation? I think the clear answer is no. For a start, see the responses from tech companies so far. I think the most diplomatic way of saying it is the responses have been varied so far to the challenges that have come out. From denial that there are problems to taking some reasonably effective steps. Part of the issue is simply that their business model militates against proper self-regulation. The more users, the more content there is on their platforms, the more user attention they can sell to the advertisers, the more their profits. Removing fake users, removing fake accounts, investigating into coordinated, inauthentic behavior, these are all costly. Tech companies are in a position of conflict where their business interests often conflict with what needs to be done in the broader society's interests. Within countries, there will be laws that deal with how in specific industries, conflict of interests ought to be resolved. It cannot be any different for tech companies. There's no difference in principle as to why it should be different. And we, as a government, would like to work with tech companies. Tech companies are our partners, and they're not our opponents. And Mr. Zuckerberg himself has said in March of this year that regulation is necessary and that, uh, you know, this is beyond tech companies. But then he also says there needs to be global standards agreed to by all the countries for such legislation. I mean, do you expect U.S., Russia, China, for a start, to sit together and agree on common standards on what is not acceptable? and what should be the common standards ought to be. So suggestion that there can be legislation is welcome, but the suggestion that such legislation should be based on universal common standards, I think is not a very practical suggestion. A different social, political, and cultural context in each country will make a broad international agreement nearly impossible. Fundamentally, and this is my main point, let's be clear, what are we talking about here? It's not about specific commercial interests. It's not about specific arguments. Ask ourselves a number of questions. Is this an issue where, first of all, does it happen? Do countries target other countries using internet platforms? And the answer is clear. Second, has it been shown to operate and has it had impact, serious impact in countries? Answer is obvious, yes. Does it have serious national security implications? You look at the US, you look at France presidential elections, you look at UK, you look at other countries in Western Europe, you look at countries in Asia. Every country has the right, the sovereign right, to decide for itself how it will protect its national security interests. It's the sovereign right. The government, with the consent of the people, will have to decide Commercial companies cannot tell us what to do about this. They have to work within the framework of the law. Our task is to make sure that the approach is fair and reasonable and uh, at the same time effective and workable. 
state cannot take a hands-off approach. The serious impact of hostile information campaigns on the social fabric, on the political sovereignty, on peace, on stability, on national, national security has to be met head-on. And it has to be met, met head-on by states working with tech companies as partners. And I think it's useful to look at what some of the other countries have done. France has introduced an information manipulation law. The law mandates transparency over social media platforms, algorithms, election advertising. It allows a French national broadcasting agency to suspend TV channels controlled by a foreign state or under the influence of that state. If they deliberately disseminate false information, likely to affect the integrity of elections. In Germany, you have the Network Enforcement Act, which was also strongly opposed by the tech platforms. It compels social networks to monitor and remove illegal content which appears online. And I quote, obviously illegal, unquote, hate speech and other postings must be removed within 24 hours of receiving a notification or the platform may face fines. Australia passed a package of new laws very quickly. It was aimed at preventing foreign interference. It includes restrictions on foreigners making political donations, stronger espionage laws, tougher penalties, a requirement that agents or lobbyists who represent foreign nations or entities must register their interest. Political entities and campaigners cannot receive $1,000 or more from a foreign donor. There are registration obligations imposed for persons or entities who have arrangements with or undertake certain activities, example, lobbying on behalf of foreign principles. New foreign interference offenses have been created targeting covert, deceptive, threatening actions <coughs> by foreign actors who intend to influence Australia's democratic or government processes or to harm Australia, which is very broad. Israel put in transparency requirements for NGOs, receiving more than half their funding from foreign sources. We put in legislation, POFMA, but that deals with falsehoods. And that's a, a framework for encouraging uh, discussion based on facts. It you know, allows corrections to be carried, requires corrections to be carried when there are falsehoods which affect public interest. But it doesn't deal with hostile information campaigns. It wasn't intended to deal with hostile information campaigns. Because hostile information campaigns, a well done hostile information campaign, will not just depend on falsehoods. It will be an entire apparatus targeting a target country using a mixture of falsehoods. Hostile information campaign is a massive thing and POFMA was not designed to deal with it and I made it clear at that point. I said, Separately, we'll put in legislation to deal with uh, hostile information campaigns. And I think we need to do that. If you look at uh, what powers will be necessary to counter foreign interference, hostile information campaigns, it will have to give the government powers to make targeted surgical interventions, to investigate, and respond expeditiously to HICs, which means also getting the information so that we are able to investigate the provenance of content to see whether and to what extent it's foreign influenced and to have the appropriate response. So the legislation needs to be able to deal with this diverse range of threats, including the flow of funds. And we may also need to consider how we restrict foreign participation in the leadership of specific organizations. And say, Singaporeans are fine, you know, you are entitled. But to what extent should foreigners be there that are closely involved in our political landscape? This is similar to our position on foreign participation in cause-based public assemblies and processions. As I sum up, I will leave you with Two thoughts. First, foreign interference is an age-old threat which is, has adapted to modern technology and states must be able to deal with these threats. Second, this is an issue of sovereignty and national security. The governments have to lead from the front. 
and we need to ensure that we have the right tools to fight this.